I'd like to speak on winning from a fairly practical perspective. I believe most everyone here has been to business school or regional test groups. And so you know the concept of winning in business. I'd like to share with you my winning experiences. Not to blow a trumpet, but because you have given me the opportunity to share my thoughts with you on this concept of winning. And because I believe that for me, at business school level, the best form of education is where and when you have businesses that sit with you and share their own perspectives. So that's what I want to do with you. For me, I like to see we can talk about winning from three specific or great life experiences. So one is what I call the turnaround of Standard Trust Bank. I was a pioneer CEO of Standard Trust Bank. We founded Standard Trust Bank from the point of view of the fact that we took over a dead bank, a bank that was totally close to customers and turned around the bank. So to me and to my colleagues, that is a winning landmark. The second thing I want to talk about is the making of Nigeria's biggest bank. So how from Archies we were able to grow to become the biggest financial services group in Nigeria within the timeline that we specify for ourselves. And the third winning experience is how we created a Pan-African bank. So I'd like to share the three, and in sharing the three, I'll talk about learning points. So that as business leaders that are winning already, but want to, you know, the issue about winning, there are two challenges. First is striving and struggling to win and become a winner. The second one is sustaining your position as a winner. People have argued that it's even more difficult sustaining your position as a winner. So I hope that in the course of our interaction today, a few learning will be learning points to be picked up as it relates to our own experience. So what happened in our case, the case of the turnaround of Sandra Trust Bank. A group of us in 1997 decided to acquire a distressed financial services institution, a distressed bank. In our history as a country, that was the first time this was being done. People same demand is deciding that instead of floating a new bank, as was the vote then, that they should, they would rather pick one that was distressed and attempt to turn it around. And we're very young then also. So we did this. But a few things are worth talking about here for the purpose of this, this uh, session. How did it happen? So first is, we assembled a very strong team. And so it means that you want to win. One of the first key things to do is the team to put together. And that, I believe, is why we're here today, getting the key team members of this organization together to, to, to brainstorm. So we assembled the right team. And we went like this to a place called Ogere. So I call it the Ogere Fields. Ogere is somewhere outside of Lagos. And that was 1997. And we had an elaborate three day retreat Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And we came up with, we revalidated the vision, this is what we're going to do, this is how we're going to play in the market to succeed, to win. And we left Ogere with the resolve to perform. And when we were leaving Ogere, one or two of, 
two people felt that it would be difficult for them to part of the team based on what we have set for ourselves by what our goals. For the rest, we determine. So we had the right team strategy session agreed what we are going to be doing, the vision of the organization, and we agreed also the corporate values. And we took all of this to the board for approval. Because this was us discussing as management, and we need to go to the board. And the board approved this, and we had to preach. In fact, the job of a leader, the job I believe all of you as leaders do to the people who work with you, is to share the vision so that everyone buy into it. We, in terms of business, we agreed amongst ourselves that we needed, by way of competitive strategy, if I would call it a corporate strategy, a corporate strategy. We said, looking at the horizon, we wanted to have a three tier strategic intent. We said, first tier, seeing this a distress bank. First year defined in terms of first two years. Let us make this a viable institution by way of profitability, by way of canceling the negative shareholders fund, by way of making sure we are adequately capital up at the time we doing, by way of regaining customers' confidence, opening our shop. So we defined first one, two years, stabilization year, year, turnaround year, making sure we bring the back back the part of profitability. So we define the second tier in terms of said in five years' time, we would like to become then Nigeria will have about 100 banks. I said, second year, a second, second tier intent, we would like to become one of the top 10 banks in the country. And so that is the mid size bank. And we define again the key indices. Then the third intent, we said in 10 years' time, we would like to become one of the top three banks in Nigeria. So this was how we left. We call it the Ogeria Accord. So we left and started executing. Again, going back, so it means getting the right team, having a clear vision, sharing the vision, agreeing on corporate values, agreeing on the corporate strategy you want to pursue, and the competitive strategy you want to also use to achieve your corporate strategy. And we have all this set for ourselves. Suffice it to say that we accomplished the first year intent. We accomplished the second one, we became a medium sized bank by doing most of the things we said we would do. Competitively, we we'll ask ourselves this is a distressed bank. And to attract or gain, gain customers' confidence, we needed to do things in a certain way. And so we came up with certain objectives or certain uh, tactics. We said we would follow our customers and make sure that we create what we call ease of use for customers. You know, so we can tell others call service delivery. Make sure that customers who interface with us are very happy with the institution, the experience is wonderful, we wanted to come back, we wanted to help us to others, we did this. We said accessibility. And let's make sure that uh, we're very, very accessible to our customers. And so by what expansion at the time, by what, what we did at the time, for those of you who remember the case of Standard Trust Bank, we rolled that rapidly across the country. In terms of brick and mortar, Especially at the time that the world was telling us, consultants were telling us that brick and mortar era was over. Not only did we do that, we also embraced technology. We were at the time the first, the biggest institution in the country that had online real time network branches that were networked. So we did all of this to be able to sell the customers at the time. Personally, at the top, there were a few learning points, a few things we did at the, at the, at the top. One, we made sacrifices, all of us. Most of the executive, in fact, all of us at the city management level, we worked very hard, we led by example. We didn't just say, you work, and we're not ready to work. We paid high, 
pastor in particular, I paid a lot of attention to recruitment at the time. I've always believed that human capital is very key for success. As a CEO in UVA, the first time I ever had an advisor work with me was on HR issue to hire digital advisor. Because HR, people management is very important for success in business. So I paid attention to recruitment and made sure that <laughs> almost everyone I was a small van, almost every officer of the van, I was involved in taking the officer. Because I wanted to make sure that we got the right to take the organization. So HR is extremely, as when I was greeting the HR director, I said, that is a man, <laughs> a key man in the organization. As a CEO then, running the branches we were running, I knew at least 90% of our customers. And I also knew what they did in the organization. And above all, we set KPIs, we set, we both at the corporate level and the level, we said, for us to achieve this year two, for us to achieve this year five, for us to achieve this year 10, we must operate in a certain way. And this corporate scorecard was translated to individuals in the organization and units in the organization. So everybody knew what was expected of the Moha. We measured this, we rewarded based on the outcome of the measurement. We also sanctioned based on the outcome of the measurement. So we, we, we did all of that. And I think, to a large extent, this helped us to, to drive and achieve the turnaround of standard trust at the time. Of course, we did well also. Make sure that we happy. Now, the second tier intent. So when we did, when we achieved most of this, we said, okay, we have said in 10 years' time, we should have become 2007. We want to be one of the top three. But 2004, already we're in the league of top five in the industry, as standard trust line. We we'll said, well, we must not even though we said 10, 10 years' time, we will become one of the top three. Nothing stops us from becoming one of the top three in year seven or year six. So we decided to, as we do annually, to do something like this. We call, we have business revaluation sessions. We have uh, sessions where we look at our corporate performance, assessment, etc., and also look at revalidate our strategies look at our goals and see if we are lagging up our head or what we need to do differently. So we had a second significant corporate retreat. And there was, okay, I led the team and we said, at the year 1997, we agreed we'll do this. Seven years down the line, we think we've accomplished most of these things. Time to do different something to see if we can until the third tier in 10, which was become one of the top three banks in the country. And we went about it. Like you're doing here, had breakout sessions, three different groups. One was see how we can fast track that, drive the, the green speed approach, that's internal growth. We said the second team, the second uh, breakout team, tell us how we can achieve this by work combination, major acquisition, etc. Then the third group tell us how we as standard trust bank can package ourselves for sale. How can we approach Barclays Bank and entice Barclays Bank to come to Nigeria to do business and buy us? How can we entice APSA to come to Nigeria and buy us to do business? So these were the three things we had at the time. And again, long weekend session. The second day we came together to debrief, and we said, okay, the conclusion was there was no way, it's not impossible, but it would take longer time for us to grow organically and become the top, one of the top players in the industry. So let us drop that idea, that, that route. So say, okay, the second route of packaging ourselves for foreign buying to buy us, yeah, we'll try, but we cannot force a foreign bank to buy us. So that was not within our control. We so said, let's drop that. And the only option that was left was a corporate combination by way of major acquisition or any form of combination that would give us that placement in the industry.
So we left that retreat with a clear position, that with a clear agreement. And that is why it's always good. It's the, one of the beauties of assembling key players in the organization to formulate or align a corporate strategy is that you get maximum or near maximum buying. Everyone understands. People are fully mobilized. They understand where you're headed and why. So we had this and left that with the result that we we're going to. No, so when we did this, came up this uh, second up position that the option to go is by way of by way of corporate combination. We this was on a Saturday, so we said, okay, let's have a second session breakout. We have three key banks, top three banks in the industry. So I'm going to displace anyone, or I'm going to acquire anyone. I'm going to match any of those three. So we said, okay. Three teams again, first bank, union bank, UBA. So we had the second breakout. And on Sunday, we debuted again. And looking at the third bank, we felt it would be easiest to go with UBA. Easier with union, difficult with first. So now the job was for me as CEO to to execute. You know, it's so easy for CEOs to tell and who work with them, execute, execute, execute. It comes to a time also that there are certain tasks that CEOs cannot delegate. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are times that CEO cannot delegate something, so it was my turn also to execute. And I said, how do I even start in this execution? <laughs> so I recall. Now, but let me pause. Let me go back again to the learning point because that's the only essence of the story. So it's good for a company from time to time to do a strategy check, to do a corporate performance check. At corporate level, not as individual level, we we'll say we do this, how we do it, how we are to And is there anything we need to do differently? Okay, what more resources do we need to bring to the organization to enable our achieve our objective? So we, it was that session that helped us again, or that tradition like you have now of meeting regularly or annually to look at how we're performing that helped us have this kind of elaborate conversation. It's good, of course, to have great people, great players in the organization. And it's also good at times to have a few external people who are independent and who are not, who are independent, who are not competitors in your line of business to sit with you to also bring steady external perspectives. So we did all of this and we came up with a revalidated position of how to proceed. Now, after all of this, you know, the real work is in doing. Because everyone can only dream and say, well, do this, but the real work is how you do it. So it was my responsibility to take this further. And I recall we had to finish that day on Sunday about 4 p.m., 5 p.m., and we said, okay, so the CEO will do this, will do this, and so on, do this. So on my way out of uh, the retreat place, I called the chairman of one of the banks. And I said, I'd like to see you. And so he said that he was trying to South Africa that night, but that, um, that uh, if it was urgent, we could see on the right, I should wait for the conference. So I said it was urgent, and so, I went over to see him that night and I said, you know, I have an idea. Just just hear me out, don't say anything, just hear me out. I have an idea. Imagine Standard Trust Bank and UBA coming together. This is the balance sheet of UBA, this bank of Standard Trust Bank. Putting them together, we can truly create a serious organization in Nigeria. UBA fifth largest, first by Standard Trust, fifth largest. I have come together, this is what our performance balance sheet is, so we we'll beat First man, you know, by. And he said to me, not bad, not bad, not bad. So I said, just think about it, and when you come back from South Africa, we can commence this conversation, and there are various options. We can merge, we can do all kinds, you know. And by the way, I'm ready to leave CEO position or to achieve subject. And I went for that. I said, if you look at the average of top four South African big banks, it's bigger than the size of all top three Nigerian banks put together average of top four. 
Uh, so I said we needed to do something different. We need, we need to create scale and size in the Nigerian banking system to be able to do the kind of things that would give us uh, the leadership position in the continent. And so this went well, but you know, so that was how the convention started. And over it took 18 months plus. But it happened. This was on Sunday we had this conversation. Sunday night, the same day we ended the retreat. That was when it started. On Monday, I had lunch with the MD, GMD then of Union Bank. I called him down, I said I would like to see him. So he said I should meet at the Quake Club. I called him alone, they said I should come over to the hotel. I went there. Same thing, I showed him. And again, he said he received it well. I said, let's push you, and I should give one of the directors who he later became a CEO of Interconnector and Lai Alavi. I should deal with him and let's let him from there. We advanced, but the UBO one came faster. So that was how the dream of becoming one of the top biggest banks in the country crystallized even quicker than we, we, we anticipated. For me, the learning point there is again also the strategy thinking, meeting, uh, setting goals, working very hard, making sacrifices, but most importantly, at that second phase was execution. Execution, and we made sure also that the combination was flawless, major day one succeeded and everything. So upon consummating the UBA transaction and, uh, and creating the institution we wanted to create at the time, we felt that we needed to diversify the geography of our earnings. We needed to, to we operated as a Nigerian bank, or that we we should go beyond Nigeria and take advantage of the huge opportunity we see across Africa. So that so at TBA we researched that and came up again with three change then. First being we want to be the leading finance group in Nigeria, not the leading, the leading. And again we defined it by control market share control of twenty percent certain things. And we said second tier intent to become a leading continental bank, a leading Pan-African bank. And third tier intent to have footprint in key global financial centers across the world. So again, we started in Nigeria. Based on the indices we set, customer base, 7 million customers accomplished, ATM, 3,000 ATM rolled up. In terms of brand network, 700 branches rolled up. In terms of uh, balance sheet size, 4 Nigerian banks with 1 trillion balance sheet, and on and on and on. So, we got all of this going, and we said to achieve the second tier intent, we needed to raise money. So we went back to the market to raise capital. And we raised capital to drive the actualization of the objective. And we came up with what we called the U Ready. U Ready is a UBA ready, you know, UBA ready for expansion. So it's about our rollout plan. And in that rollout plan, we addressed the things the selection criteria for the countries we want to go to, so that yes, you have some countries in Africa, but which country do you go to phase one, phase two, phase three? And next was human resource requirements, the resources you needed to fire the expansion, because to you expand, there's so many. So even we massively over recruited and even got some people trained in French, etc., in readiness for that phase of expansion. We created a team, a cross-functional team for expansion, lawyers, accountants, uh, business people, all kinds, regulatory consultants to make sure that we started the rollout across Africa. Upon retirement, the time I was leaving UB in 2010, we had presence in 18 African countries. From a long time <laughs> From a one country institution. It took its toll on us, <laughs> more great hair, more great hair. <laughs> and in fact, it, take, it takes its toll on the bank today. If you look at UBA stock price in comparison with the peer banks in the country, you see that UBA is not adequately priced. The reason being that short, most capital market operators are short term investors. They look at the short term, they really do not care much about 
you know, R and D or a reinvestment to make sure you create a better future. And so, first year, second year, like when we planned, we looked at the numbers for the expansion, we said the first three years we're going to take zero pity. But we did not know the capital market would crash as it is at this point. So we said, okay, zero pity, but after that will come the lease. And so let's, let's go through it. So UBA stock price, the back end we look at UBA compared to other Nigeria. Like the truth is, UBA is comparable only to two banks in Africa. It is comparable to Standard Bank and Eco ETI, not Eco by ETI, because it is not a one country operational institution. It operates today in 20 countries across Africa. And so the impact of most of those start raising so much capital to fire things that are not directly bringing profitability in the short term, just now that most of the countries are not turning profit because of the need to, you know, you so fast before, <laughs> before you read. So the real story of UBS, uh, UBS, the real UBS story, I believe, is going to be told in years to come, not even at this point in time. So that's how. So what, therefore, would I say was the success story, uh, secret again, for this second tier intent of creating a Pan-African brand and achieving the period we did? Again, execution, articulate your thoughts very well, share the vision of the KP4, get the right resources, execute, 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 measure execution, reward, Sanction and move on. So I would think um, for 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 me, <coughs> these are the three key winning experiences I wanted to share with you at this at this point. The future will write a book when you go still that and complete the nice still working progress. <laughs> but uh, I like to stop here and uh, let me let's let's throw the call open. I don't know if I'm doing well on time. How many minutes left? Anyway, so let's spend like 30 minutes. Let's take questions, comments from, 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 from the audience. And feel free, please, no old bad, just let's discuss anything you want to raise. And believe I can to answer from a practical point of view on winning or any other administrative issues. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Ben. Thank you so much, Mr. Ben. And my question is, what inspires you? I like to succeed. I like to win. You need to know your indices for measuring winning. So that when you get there, you know. There are times you might just have this meeting, you know, keep running after something, in thinking you're trying to win. So I always ask myself, I like to win. Anything I have, I'm doing, I like to succeed in it. And so I always ask myself, what do I need to do to succeed? So I, I write them down, you know, what I need to do to succeed. What do I require? to execute, to succeed. Because what I need to do is one thing, but you also requires anything. So it can be, in my opinion, it can be capital, it can be human resource, it can be brand equity, it can be contacts, it can be, you know, working with the right consultants, the right ideas, etc. So I also define, so first, I like to win, it keeps me going. But winning is not enough, so what does it take to win? And what do I need to resolve my life to win? And how do I know when I've won? Look at that. So, you see me, if you listen to when I was talking about certain things, I'm specifying things we wanted to achieve. So, okay, this, this, this. I have the and at time not to elaborate. One, two, three. One, two, three. If you get there, then you are energized to do more. So, basically, what inspires me is the need to succeed, the need to make a difference. You know, in our industry, for instance, back in industry, when later years, other young people became CEOs, I called one day, we had bankers come team meeting, and I called two of them, I chatted. Once that had told me to please help mentor his son uh, when he was leaving the bank, he was leaving the bank and never the son. And uh, so after bankers come team meeting, I said, you know, you guys should pay me some reality. You young CEOs, because I suffer for all of you. <laughs> you know, when I became CEO, I was like, oh, I know uh, it was uh, people, you know, and you know, this is not at your last song. So people, people were like, who is he? Where is he coming from? What part? It was not easy, not easy in one bank or something, just coming up like that. And uh, they didn't think we would succeed. And I think the difference we made opened the doors for others. Again, when we started uh, this uh, whole experiment, 
people did not want to turn or think about turning around the bank or touching any band that was distressed. But again, we made a difference. So for me, it's more of winning anything we do and proving that things are, are possible. I just want to know, in the cost of achieving all this, have you been one bit discouraged? And what was your reaction to that situation? You know, it's all not usually as rosy as you read it here. Yeah? <laughs> Less nice, eh? You know, and now you say, why did I even start this? <laughs> why? Why did I even start this? You know, let's even go back a bit. So, I thought in recent situation. So, you look at top price of UBA, for instance. Because, by the way, I will not only see UBA, I'm also a key investor in UBA. So, you look at top price of UBA. You see UBA compared to other banks. Well, you know the fundamental, you know certain things that can price into the top price of UBA. The certain things that are not brought in now. If anything, they are taken away from UBA at this point in time. And it's often like, should we have actually even commerce on this journey? Or just remain Nigerian bank and just do profit and like every other Nigerian bank? So that also is part of China you have to go with, go through at from time to time. So, but just you look at the big picture, because we are long-term investors. You look at the big picture and you say, in the long run, this is the right thing. This is the fundamentals are there, the science are there, things are doing well. But let's go beyond that. You know, the the UPA core value, we we'll call it uh, so By the way, the new company that I chair uh, is uh, took is never had the core values of UBA. H E I R, you know, H for humility, E for empathy, I for integrity, and R for resilience. That resilience <laughs> is what keeps you sustained you when those tough moments come. They do come in business. And you have, they come in business in different forms. But, you know, if you have a long term perspective, series of short-term challenges cannot be equated with what you achieve in the long run. So you just keep telling yourself, I want to achieve this. And for us, for instance, we're lucky, if you call it that way, that our first tier intent in this corporate tunnel and transformation journey was successful, second tier successful. So anything we go through, is okay, we know how to do this thing, we we'll overcome it, we we'll get to that destination. There was once we had a you know, by the way, UB is the only South African band that operates in New York. There was a time we had OCC, the regulatory body in the US, after the 9-11 um, sanction UBA for certain transactions that, in fact, we actually reported, you know. And the, you know, the negative, as you said, the, to, so they sent the sanction, we got to never sanction the day before, and the next day it's going to hit the press. And I'm like, oh my God, sanction. How do you, you know, you don't wish that tomorrow never comes. <laughs> so yes, we do have those. It goes in the territory, but you, 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 you overcome. You said uh, the very day you finished the meeting, the retreat at uh, uh, you called the UBA chairman and uh, you agreed to meet you. You went there straight, and uh, you told the man that you are ready to drop that as a step down as the CEO if that was what it takes for this to happen. Eventually, you became the MD of the new UBA. Now, do I attribute that, you're becoming the new MD, to your conviction? And again, you've been able to convince the management of UBA that you are ready to make the sacrifice. And as a result, they saw the, the need to allow you to lead the organization. In other words, commitment, readiness to sacrifice, is key to winning. At times, if you also read about, uh, listen to, or read case studies, and is there a leader that successful? You see, even this one, you see all of you wearing your shirt, winning. There are some symbols and symbolic uh, gestures that are good for success and for winning. So for us, we said we needed to identify an animal or an object that we wanted to put that set. So we said the Lion King. The Lion King is the king of the jungle. <laughs> the lion is big in size. At times, in terms of length, it's as long as 2.5 meters. So in detail alone, it's about a meter. In terms of weight, at times up to 250, 300 kgs. They're like me, thanks. 
yet extremely agile. The lion can do 80 miles per hour, that, um, 80 kilometers per hour. And a lion can cross, that like, jump a ditch that is 6.5 meters wide. The lion can jump a height that is 6 meters high with live animal in his mouth. And when the lion strikes, it strikes strategically, spot on. And that is why a lion can kill a horse and a zebra. So we said, for us, so it's after you see the LK, lion, lion, here and go. So you see, when you spoke, I said, you are a <laughs> lion. But let me answer the question. Two things, yes and no. What happened was, as I believe, is real, the real situation in real life. Most corporate combinations, like by what measure to succeed, will have element of acquisition. Because at times it needs someone to drive Teddy Boat. When we commence the conversation, first, I so again, so to so win also, negotiation skill is very important. In fact, very, very important. So when we started, I just and I was speaking the truth. What was important to me was, and I believe if a system is objective and merit driven, and even if I was number two in the combined entity or number three, I believe that ultimately we can actually get to become number one. So what was important, let's create that in that platform. But the course of our discussion and negotiation, it became clear we Standard Trust had to buy 33% of EBA. So by way, by prior to the major, we actually were in charge of EBA. So we now brought the two entities together to consummate the combination. So that was exactly what happened in this, in this area. I engaged the CEO of ETI, Arnold Edwin, and I had a meeting with him. I said, Arnold, this is ETI and this is UBA. I'm CEO of UBA, but I respect you in the industry. I'm ready to become one of your deputy. But let's have ETI and UBA met. I've always wanted to create a big institution. Let's have ETI and UBA met. I ready to drop to, to. For he didn't take it, he, they took the first work out from which I'm going to work out. So, yes, humility is good. I one of our core values. I would have a good of what we, we, we like to become more. But what's important is the objective. You know, what you want to achieve, and you must separate yourself from the corporate objective. At times, they don't really work together, but most times they are aligned, and when they are aligned, they get better results. I was uh, made known that uh, you are an employer of very young men, and most of your advert in your days with UBA, I think the minimum age, sorry, the maximum then was 26, mostly. <laughs> So I want to know if you can share with us right. what motivated you and how you succeeded with your employment of only the young policy, considering the high level turnover that reigned over the banking kingdom at that time. I started fairly early in life. I was challenged very early in life. And so I... I told myself that first I owe it to young ones also to create opportunities for them. Two is that in my dealings, and as I believe the HR director here would attest to, and in fact empirically established, young people or younger people are more impressionable. And if we agree that in the performance of winning equation, that human factor is key for success, and that you don't achieve success when people are not positively aligned with vision, and that you don't achieve success when people are not motivated and properly, in fact, indoctrination is key for success. Positive indoctrination. So I also believe that it's easier. Third point is young people or younger people are more daring. They have more energy. And in my view, and we needed to do something different. And so we did a different type of mindset. And so that drove that at the, at the time. 
with your experience, building the kind of organization you have built, and for some folks, some of us that are willing to become an entrepreneur, do you think anybody can do business in Nigeria and build the kind of organization you build solely on integrity without cutting costs and making it to the top? Let me go back a bit to our story. <coughs> you know, which, as he said, was a bit for the purpose of this, and so that you can buy a good when it's publicity. The, when we first wanted to buy, buy a distress bank, get taken over a distress bank, Crystal Bank had been put on the list for liquidation by Chief Anthony Ali, uh, Bodaje, and uh, General Bachelor. And I went to Abuja, camped almost two days to see Tony Ali. And when I finally saw him, I explained to him why he should not liquidate this bank, that we can fund this bank. And I told him, no, I would like to, I already promised, so you, you know, your thoughts had to analyze things. I said to him, and he was all looking at me, <laughs> I said, if you liquidate this bank, there's a cost to the society. To the country. If you don't liquidate this bank, give us the opportunity, you may allow us this cost. I said, which one is better, sir? And after one year, the bank not going to go ahead and people give us the opportunity, we want to turn around this bank. And he called Uduzi, Uduzi was central bank the big governor there. He says, take Crystal Bank out of that list. He called the border the same thing. And that was how Crystal Bank government announced our seven nine banks. So one of the banks that they took out of the bank. And you would hear of corruption, this government to the to the in doing anything for certain people. But indeed, it's not like that in every situation. I didn't know him before then, and that was my first time of meeting. I booked up from Steve Rosanya was his assistant someone. He helped, he helped me until till I finally got to see him. So in this country also, you do have people in high offices who are straightforward. You also have a good video to get legitimate. I want you to shed light on the importance and uh, how best Nigerian groups can take advantage of it. This payment transformation that Central Bank is aptly uh, pioneering or championing is one that everyone of us should support. And, and I think it's, going, it's already succeeding and we should all support it. It's only Anyway, so I think the cash that we have in our society, the economy is too high. We need to begin to formalize the informal sector. And one of the ways of formalizing the informal sector is by also doing what is not being done. Also, one of the ways of dealing with corruption in our system is also what is being done. Now, so that you can trace almost all payments and form movement in society, in the economy. Now, how will it, uh, can you leverage it on it? I think, uh, I believe through your distributors, so on the and the in fact, good point you raised, very good point, very very strategic. But I think if I were Nigerian employees and the MD by the sitting next to the executive director, you'd be that's also since we're heading this uh, cash light uh, movement in the society. You need to really you need to engage with a, one of the pioneering banks in this space and see how you can help procure POSs, POSs for your trucks. And POSs for all your distributors and for all your merchants, all your the off license, what they call where beer parlors, you know. So you need to have it is because it's going to fundamentally change the industry, your everyday economy. And so it's good that if someone goes to drink, you should be able to swipe and pay. Very, very good point. So I would say. You guys should look at uh, partnership uh, opportunities now. Thank you. Uh, in Nigeria, we are living in a very difficult economy. Uh, at the age of 34, so many people are still struggling to grow for themselves. <laughs> Please, you need to tell us how it so happened that at that age, you've got that resource, you've got the drive, you've got everything that you want to shoot up to that level. If you add that image of your other story to us, somebody like me will be more inspired. When I spoke before, I said I started very early, and uh, there are some stories that are better left for the right time. However, let's say that. 
when we did our first transaction, which is the turnaround of standard transaction server, we really did not put in any money. We used our brain. We did what was then called, or what is called, debt equity swap. And we used, we created instruments to enable us achieve this. So it is not necessarily always. And by the way, I'm not aware of any incident that does seem like this since then. People had lost so much money in the bank, so people were not about we we're going to lose everything. And he said to someone, are you ready to convert your deposit to equity in this, in this bank? Majority, some said yes, they will convert to equity. Some said no, they will not convert to equity, they won't have. I said, okay, there's no money to pay you. But if you want out, okay, and you don't want to convert to equity in this institution, how about I give you a promising note, <laughs> to an the <Illuminate> note, <laughs> and I say I'll pay you in three years. And by the way, because you had almost lost everything in this bank, are you ready to discount for me to pay you 80% face value in two, three years' time? And most of them almost all said yes. And those who didn't say yes to just because NDIC insured deposit is how much? 50,000. NDIC insured deposit was 50,000. So either you, if you have 10 million naira, uh, NDIC should pay 50,000. Or you have the opportunity to convert the 10 million to put in the bank. Or let me discount it from you and pay you by period of time. So we did, we did, we did all of that. For a long time, I'm from very young, you've been in charge. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there were times when you were never in charge, you were not in charge, you know, and you, need, you needed to have to get things done. And a lot of them were risky things that you would have to sell to people above you. And you really believed in these things. Now, it required you to either just shut up or take a risk. Like, I know you're a risk taker, but how often did you really take those risks? And I can imagine you going into trouble. You know, can you tell us a bit about that part? Someone asked a question, did you have your challenging moments? Yes. In business, it goes with the territory. But I started very early. I believe I was recognized, or identified, sorry, early, early in career. I always had a certain purpose, vision, what uh, I wanted to, to, to do with my, with my colleagues, with my friends. And we set time, time lines, everything, and we worked hard towards making all of this come, come, come true. But by the way, your chairman, Chief Jamud, when uh, I was a corporate bank, and I was the account officer, he's the account officer. And I believe he also played a role in my career, in my career because uh, he was close to my CEO, and I believe he, he made, he made, uh, he was, my relationship when it was still of is that that account was very good. I ran that account very well. So I say, I was challenged very early in life, and I told myself I would not fail. I would not fail, and I tried to surpass expectations of my bosses. And back to the man who asked the question, why do you like to, why do I like to hire young people? I put myself in their point. I put them in my position when I was young, or younger, <laughs> young, no, 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 young. When I was young, I put myself and, you know, challenges I got, I told myself I will not mess up and I will must surpass expectations. You know, it's always good to be rational, to drive yourself and tell yourself that you will not let people down. When people are trusted in your forces, in making, I got appointed by my 12 months after post-graduate school. And I just said to myself, if even me, to I don't know if I'll do it even today, despite the fact I believe be young one. You know, say three years before. But so, when you get uh, such uh, early responsibilities in life, how they work, making, helping you. But if you're not good, it was to derail you because you lack the maturity and discipline to, to, to play that role very well. And it, it will actually become a problem. That's why at times, when you buy challenge people too early, they derail. At times also, when you challenge people early, it helps the rational one to develop and even get better than that. What was the tipping point for you? Because I know at the stage in your career, when you started out early, you had a lecturing opportunity. I mean, you have a lecturing job and you say, yeah, it's comfortable, unquote. You don't need to stress yourself so much apart from doing your academics. I mean, 
you decided to then leave that and go into business and entrepreneurship, which is much more challenging. So really what was the deciding factor for you? The point was I wanted to be a banker based on certain factors at, at the time. And, and so when I started as an a bank, and I kept, <laughs> I was telling somebody this story. You know, those days, you know, we used to read a lot of uh, Fortune magazine books, you know, and Fortune magazine, you know, Fortune, the American Fortune magazine, and they used to talk about turn around, turn around, turn around, corporate engineering, corporate. <laughs> so I got very excited about this, and I started to, to read more and more and more and more. And uh, when the boom, the banking industry started in Nigeria, I thought it was only a matter of time that the industry would go again to trouble and that people who knew how to run or turn around banks would have the opportunity to do so. So we, we saw the vision early enough, and uh, when it happened, we were ready for it. And that took advantage of it. Who are your role model? I like three people. And I like uh, Michael Jackson, late Michael Jackson. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. I don't know if any of you have seen This Is It. Yes. Have you seen it? Yes. And I believe it's a learning video. If you look at that video, you saw a man who did not attain success by chance. But a lot of things went behind. And so it is my, my passion for excellence, my passion for hard work, my passion for making your things are done properly. And I thought Michael Jackson epitomized that in the world. And so I was influenced to a large extent by Michael Jackson. Another person that has influenced me in life uh, greatly, the Big Gates. You know, this is another regular to him. You know, regular today, the Gates, uh, Bill and Melinda Foundation, they spend billions of dollars on philanthropy every year. One of the richest men on earth. But what was his background? Even St. Joe, but not that he's my brother, but in the case, you know, just, you know, brain. Using the brain. So, you know, you can't create capital, actually. That is virtual capitalism with brains. So I saw that in, in BK, in BK. So I, and he also suffered in process. He also knew when to leave. You know, so anyway, so big cases. And the third person I like is more important. <laughs> if I aspire to become more important, I pray to be a small more important. You mentioned brand equity in your story. So I just want to ask what, uh, looking at other brands or organizations um, in, in your process and building your brands, did you look at? I did. Second. And what were those brands and what did you exactly learn you took on board in building your key brand equity going forward? You know, because I am a strong believer in governance. And when I was greeting somebody's uh, company secretary and like I said, wow, that is a governance person, I believe that companies that are due to last are companies that have strong governance fundamentals. And so we will study and come back to some of the things we, we studied in that area. But uh, at UBA, at some point, I sent a team to Nigerian Bruce to find out how Nigerian I heard you had COT course, course of the Nigerian team or something like that. And based on you, I also set up a course of the Nigerian team in UBA. Partner and all that. Yeah, we studied local brands. You know, and of course, you can't talk about local, look at local brands that are an object like Nigerian brand. We also learned on that about Nigerian brand. When we're trying, you know, some people have described and said about uh, sales people, marketing people. We said, you know, banking, we claim that we're a financial services industry and that we sell products. The difference between banks and, say, Nigerian brand is that we sell non tangible products. Nigerian brand sells chairman. I would say an outstanding presentation on the team winning. Um, it was clear that from uh, the questions and, and, the, and the deep silence while you were doing the first half hour, that it was um, impactful and the personal touch you gave Tony, I think, uh, uh, made impact on, um, on everybody. Um, you handled the question with um, a lot of 
uh, I would say, personal touch and a lot of people took um, their learnings and um, I think uh, today's presentation was spot on for what we've been doing the last um, couple of, uh, of days. Um, I love the one about the HR director and um, that as a manager, once you feel that you've got the right people, I think uh, it saves you so much sleep. You finally sleep. The moment you have the feeling as an MD, you do not have the right people, you sleep very bad. I like that one. Uh, the other thing is, it is not just a lucky day that you become a winner. It is mindset, 24 hours around the clock. And it is also about vision, preparation, and I love the part about execution. Let me, let me thank you on behalf, and I'm sure on behalf of all of us, and uh, please let me give you uh, as a token of our appreciation, uh, I would say uh, two gifts that belong to a real winner. Uh, we have uh, one pack of the only beer that pot. And some uh, Heineken handcuffs, and I hope it goes well with the, the Heineken book and all you've learned from my journey. Thank you very much.